Hello, and welcome again to the Sensor Plane Photography Podcast, where light and technology come together. I'm Jason O'Dell. Today's topic is going to be on mirrorless camera systems. Now, mirrorless cameras are interchangeable lens cameras that drop the traditional single lens reflex mirror and traditional optical viewfinder. By doing so, these cameras can be smaller, lighter, and have some different performance characteristics than DSLRs. Now, mirrorless cameras have been on the market now for several years, but they're really starting to diversify. And to help me talk about the mirrorless camera systems today, I've got a special guest to join me via teleconference, and that's photographer Tony Sweet. Tony's based out of Maryland in the United States, and he leads a lot of travel and creative photography workshops. Now recently, Tony picked up a mirrorless camera system. He's been traveling with it and shooting with it extensively over the last six months, including a recent photo safari that he led in Havana, Cuba. So let's get Tony on the line and talk about mirrorless camera systems. Uh, hey, Tony, welcome to the Sensor Plane Podcast. How are you, buddy? Jason, what's happening, buddy? Doing great. Doing, Doing great. great. We weathered the ice storm, and uh, we're good to go. <laughs> oh, you got ice. We had... Uh, Almost minus 20 yesterday morning here in Colorado. It's been been cold, but not not as much snow as probably you guys have been getting. A little well, chilly. Yeah, a little, yeah. little chilly. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could join me on the podcast today. It's This is cool. My new thing with doing video, so we try to get this to uh, to work. But it's good to it's good to see you in your, your bandana, man. I can pretend. My native environment, my native we, garb, yeah. That's we, right. we can do Brady Bunch. <laughs> I look over here like I'm looking at you. <laughs> Awesome right, stuff, right. uh, or is it Partridge Family? I can't remember which. But I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> today I, I got you on the show not because not just because I love your work with your photography, but lately <laughs> we've been uh, you've been telling me about how you and others have been um, using mirrorless cameras, and and that's something that's oh, yeah. only shown up. Uh, really, it's like been a phenomenon the last what would you say about four years. Maybe a little it, more than it that. Be, it began. It began a little over four years ago. I, I, the first one we saw was the, the Olympus Micro Four Thirds. Right. That was the first. The first. They had a few lenses for it, and a workshop client had that, and he was blown away. And uh, so was I. I mean, it was the beginning, but it wasn't where I needed it to be yet, you know. But uh, once those things start, they just they just keep going. So that was the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Much, yeah. um, I remember on the Image Doctors, Rick and I were talking about Micro Four Thirds because there was Panasonic, there's Olympus, um, and they they came out with those. And and you know the whole point for our listeners, I mean, a, a mirrorless system camera uh, is less about the format of the sensor, although that's going to be important. It, it doesn't have the DSLR mirror where the the light comes in the lens, goes up through a viewfinder and over, uh, and the mirror flips out of the way. So a mirrorless camera can be a lot smaller, right? That's because... where that's where your size is. That huge box with the mirror. I mean, once you once you get rid of that, you, know, you have a, a dramatically smaller piece of hardware. You know, <laughs> absolutely. And so we've seen Olympus. And now Fuji's got some, and I know that's what you're you're using. We'll talk about that. Sony's a major player. They've just come out with mm -hmm. some new ones. Nikon has one. Um, in fact, that's what that's what I'm using for my little mirrorless. Is this little this little guy? And you can see just how much smaller this is in a DSLR. Oh, sure. I see that you've got some back there. Um, yeah. Uh, to to <laughs> look at. So, I mean, sort of the two the two things that I see with these mirrorless cameras is, you know, if you're already using a DSLR. You know the the biggest thing is is got to be size. I mean this this little guy. You know th this is what I use for for family kinds of, of pictures. Sure, but it's perfect. Yeah. But the question that I have, you know, that that I think a lot of people want to know about is, you know, you got sensor size, you got camera size, you got lenses, you got all. You're talking about an entirely new system, and That's so. Um, mm -hmm. You know, why would someone want to go with a mirrorless system? I mean, why? So you, you have uh, you recently got the Fuji system. Tell me yeah, a little bit about yeah. your thought process behind that, because I know you try all kinds of cameras, and you're a big Nikon guy. You've got all the Nikon stuff. So uh, uh, this is a Nikon system, right? <laughs> and this is the equivalent lens in the Fuji system. Oh, awesome! Okay, so that's your basic comparison, right? And uh, the weight is probably 25% of what this is. You know, um, this is a great stuff, no doubt about it. But I'm not getting any younger, you know what I mean? And, and, and carrying all this stuff around, 
Um, the reason that we did that is, is for all the tangential benefits. The file size, the gear was like weatherproof, you know, like bulletproof in a lot of ways. Unless it falls in the water, which I've been known to do anyway, aside from that. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much bulletproof, you know. Um, and I was waiting for an equivalent mirrorless to come out, you know, and it, it took a while. And then uh, um, you know, my friend Bill Fortney and my friend John Barkley, who I, he, like you know those guys pretty much, yeah, um, yeah. you know, went that way first. And yeah, I trust what John says. Um, that aside, I've known Bill for 20 years. And no one knows more about camera gear than Bill, as far as I'm concerned. You know, he's, he's, that's that's his deal, you know. Mm -hmm. And when Bill left Nikon, he bought a Fuji system the very next day. Wow. So I said, you know what, man, you tell me about that. And we talked about it, and Bill's one of those guys, I'm sure you got them. If they just say buy it, you buy it, because you know that they know their stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bill just said get it, and that along with John's uh, uh, recommendation, I went ahead and just traded my uh, D3S, just right. the body. And I was able to get a body. Uh, this is the X, uh, the X Pro One, and um, I got one a body and four lenses with a D3S plus one thousand dollars. That's not bad. That that's not a bad move up. You know, that's not a bad move up. And I say up because you get a sixteen bit ninety one megabyte file, and the uh, the Fuji Color. It, like anyone who knows the last 15, 20 years in the business knows that Fuji is a color company. I mean, they're, right. they got it, you know, and, and you can see it now in the raw file. It, it, I mean, even Bill you know, agrees with me or I agree with him that um, the files from the Fuji are noticeably better than in, in the commensurate larger systems. No question, you know. Now, the Fuji, it, you're using the, the X-Pro one, and then there's other ones out there because they... I, I keep seeing more and more coming out. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's... That's an APS-C sensor, correct? It is indeed. Okay, so, I mean, that sensor has matured... I mean, I, I say that sensor. That format has tremendously matured over the years because that was the original, you know, Nikon digital can. I mean, everyone's right. had these APS-C sensors. Um, we kind of panned them when they were in DSLRs being, oh, you're sent it's too small, it's crop sensor, yada, yada, yada. Well, that was, yeah, that was a whole other macho issue, you know. That's sure. What that was. <laughs> but you put one of these in a, in a small body, um, it's a pretty large sensor. I mean, that's a I mean, they have great dynamic range. I mean, anybody using a Nikon D7000 or D7100 or, heck, even a D3000, it's got an excellent sensor, but it's still a much larger form factor. you got lenses to That's carry right. around. Um, That's so right. tell our listeners, I mean, y you do a lot of travel photography, a lot of landscape photography. I know you got started doing a lot of macro flower photography. This seems yeah. like the perfect yeah. kind of system to have when you are – doing a lot of traveling because of the size and weight issues, correct? Well, what's, well yes, but what's great about uh, that specific scenario is that when you're photographing people, and, and, and believe me, the Cubans are, are, you, you know, you aren't new to this tourist pointing camera in their faces, right? But, but being human beings like we are, you know, you know, I'm much less prone to be freaked out you know, by something this size, right, than with something this size, right. right? So there's the intimidation factor, right? Which which is major with people, you know. And I find that uh, they're much looser with a smaller system. It, it's more personal, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not quite as like you you got this huge thing pointed in their face, you know. So that's one thing. But the um, like I've shot nature with this wildlife, not wildlife, except when it's close. But mostly scenic stuff. So I started shooting this thing in the Badlands this past September. And have I pretty much not put it down since, you know, mm -hmm. landscape people long exposures. You can pop on a, uh, uh, you know, an adapter ring, right? And I'm able to, and, and I can do like you know five, ten, fifteen stop. I can put on a, uh, a split grad if I want to use that and pop that on, you know. So it, it, it it's pretty much the only limitations are in what's available. We need to get the uh, ten to twenty four, which is a fourteen to thirty five. That'll be out, uh, right? So lenses. 15. That's the only issue, and there's a couple little firmware issues, but in general, um, I just need the Nikon for a couple of very specific situations, multiple exposures, um, much higher exposure bracketing, five stops rather than three in the XE2, okay. and multiple, like I said, multiple exposures, and a super wide. 
once we have those, one of those is hardware, which is a 15 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. and the other two are firmware. And people are on that right now that have more connected with Fuji than I do right now, and they're kind of on them to get that firmware up to snuff. And once those three items are done, Jason, there's no real need, except in the most inclement weather, to ever go large, large camera again, in my opinion. Excellent. Well, yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll give you a little bit about what where I'm coming from. So now I picked this is a Nikon One V2. Now this uses a, a what Nikon calls CX format. So this is much smaller. This is a 14 megapixel uh, sensor, but it's 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 much smaller. It's still bigger than a point and shoot. Um, but I, I I definitely see on the one hand I see the image quality limitations as compared to my regular Nikon's, but um, you know, it's interesting with a with a mirrorless camera. I mean, if I pop this little guy off, I mean, there's there's the sensor right right Pretty there. Much. Yeah, uh, this right. this is a 50 millimeter equivalent. Um, so this is a, an 18 millimeter. Uh, this thing has almost a 3x crop factor, whereas the APS-C is wow. one and a half. So this is 2.7x. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, right. You, you know, it, it's interesting what I see. I see each manufacturer sort of brings a different piece of the puzzle to the game, and none of them have quite completely figured it out. Like, this little guy, even though its image quality doesn't rival my, you know, D800, my D4, or anything like that, it, it, it is comparable to what I used to get out of my D2X, um, right. you know, in terms right. of, of noise and stuff like that. But this little camera will shoot 15 frames per second raw. <laughs> Now it's not it's a 12 bit it's not a 16 bit. On the other hand, it doesn't have auto bracketing, it doesn't have multiple exposure and for long exposure it's got a limitation of about 2 minutes. It just it shuts down after 2 minutes that's as long as you can That's get. that's enough for a lot of yeah. Yeah, it's that. enough for a lot of things but I'm not going to do any crazy yeah, stuff. And you know, I yeah. found a little 10 stop uh, screw in filter <laughs> for for not much and it didn't it wasn't I, I think it was like $50 or something. I don't know. I got Mm -hmm. Couldn't put it on here. So, so this camera I bring around. Uh, it's got a very fast autofocus system. I mean, this this what Nikon did right with this camera is they've got the autofocus. It's tremendous. Now I've got a six-year-old son. He runs around a lot. We go to Disney World or something. This little camera <laughs> is great. 15 frames a second. And it's got something else that I like. It's called face priority autofocus. I hand this camera to uh, my wife, my mother-in-law, or my son, even six. All they got to do is push the button. And this thing finds your face and it focuses on you. So that's cool. But that's what I am giving up feature, is that yeah. I don't look at this camera as a replacement quality-wise, image-wise, for what I'm doing uh, with my D800e or my D4. Yeah. Like when I go, and especially different like tool. with the birding. Different tool. Yeah. It, it is yeah, a totally exactly. different tool. So I like this a lot, but I'm not going to say this system um, is the, you know, Re complete replacement for an enthusiast uh, to to you know go out and shoot. But I like this camera. I mean, I, I like the system. Obviously, I've bought it. And they've got some. They've got some sure. good lenses for it. They even got a a super wide zoom that it's a an eighteen to thirty five equivalent uh, stabilized. So that, good that, that, that range, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah. But you know, yeah. one one thing I did do is I convert. And this is a I think goes back to your point with the um, the size of the system. I had the V one before this. I converted it to infrared. Because if you're just fooling around, you don't want to have a huge second body for infrared. So having a small body to just tuck in my bag. And with an adapter, I can mount F-mount lenses on this camera. Oh, okay. So I can Great. use my Nikon. So I can put, you know, a big 14 and 24 on this sure, guy sure, um, and, sure. and get some decent results. But anyway, I mean, I, I think mirrorless is cool. So the, the players that, you know, how do you see it right now? I know we got... We've got Nikon, which is kind of a niche product, which is more like a point-and-shoot replacement, a, a, a very good one, an, an awesome one, you know, sure excellent autofocus, fast shooting. But then you got Olympus is still doing micro four-thirds, right? That's a more square format. Uh, that's a 2x crop factor, if mm -hmm. I recall. And then, um, and I know Panasonic makes some, some too. I'm not sure of the state of that market. You know, you told us about the Fuji, which is excellent. Everything I've heard about it has been great. And there's also Sony out there, and they're pushing the envelope sort of in a different direction, which is they've started making 35 millimeter, or what you call full frame, yeah, mirrorless well, that's, cameras. That's kind, of a, that's kind of a point of debate because it, it's just like, I think of it like, okay, let's go to the iPhone for a second because it's the exact same trail that is, right? If you buy an iPhone and want to use the camera, 
the whole point is that it fits in your pocket that it's readily available. Right. When you start manufacturing a, a uh, you know an adapter for a Canon 70 to 200, it's kind of it gets ridiculous, you know. <laughs> so I mean, it, it's the same. I mean, what what's the point if you're gonna like start right. adding more stuff to it, right? It's the same thing with uh, the Sony, which is a great. It's got a D800 sensor, and they have right now m many fewer lenses than Fuji mm -hmm. does in their array of, of of lenses, right? So they're giving you an adapter for your Nikon lenses. So you're back to almost square one again, where you're popping on the super heavy glass, mm -hmm. you know, on a small body. body. So, so what's the point of what you're doing here? You know, if you want to save weight, the lenses are available with all the manufacturers, most with Fuji, you know, but um, that are smaller, they're lighter, they're a fraction of the weight, you know, and, and uh, like Jay Mizell says, man, the less you carry, the more you shoot. I mean, like you're going to hand carry that camera and shoot it at ISO 3200 with no problem, which we did in Cuba a lot. ISO 1600, 3200, you know, almost wide open. It's phenomenal, you know, but if I needed to, um, to, uh, uh, uh Set down my camera bag, unzip the thing. First of all, I, I miss a ton of shots. First of all, right. And I would plus I wouldn't take as many. It's a different paradigm completely when you start shooting mirrorless, lighter system, shoulder bag rather than a backpack. You know what I mean? It changes mm -hmm. everything, and it saves your back. You know. Well, I mean, I'm I absolutely hear you on that one. Um, and and trust me, it's like. I I have a 600 millimeter. I have a D4 for bird photography. Sure, sure. I love what it does. I mean, I love what that combination. And you put a converter on it. You know, 800 millimeter. You know, whatever. And it's amazing. Do I like taking that through the airport? Hell no. I mean, that thing is a beast. I hate carrying it. I hate the bigger tripod. I love the what it delivers. I just hate getting there and setting. I mean, carrying that thing up. I mean, oh my goodness! I thought I was going to die. Um, but you know, for that particular purpose, that's right. Um, nothing know, else. Nothing else can do that. Right. So it, it gets into that tools for the job kind of discussion again. So exactly what it does. What I want to do is, um, you know, you just recently got back from a workshop that you led in Cuba. Is that correct? Uh, Co-led. John Barkley and I uh, took care of that. Yeah. Awesome. And you were shooting with your your Fuji uh, X Pro One. Um, there was roughly four of us down there that um, four or five, maybe more on that uh, group of like, uh, I think 16 or 17, that only shot the Fuji X system. Very cool. That's all they brought. That's all they brought, you know. Okay, and, and if you're and watching result, at home, I'm going to put a link on my blog to your website so if people want to know about your upcoming workshops, because you do a oh, lot. thank you. Thank um, you. We'll, we'll get that. So check check that in there on luminescentphoto.com. Just go to the blog there for this episode, and we'll get I it. I appreciate that. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, so you sent me some images. So what I want to do is I want to pull up those those images, and let's let's take a look at those, okay? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Tony. So, here, take me through this shot. This was now. These are all from your recent trip to Cuba, correct? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. This is um, this is one of our guys. He's well aware of um, photography, photographers. He's uh, a very nice man. I forget his name. It's I don't want to say the wrong name, Pablo or something like that. But uh, we've been shooting him for years. And we give him a lot of money. We tip him because he's, he's a phenomenal subject. I mean, just uh, nothing better. You know, just a great face, very nice guy, very kind, very uh, very generous as far as giving us, his, giving us his time, that kind of thing. But this is shot um, with the uh, 55 to 200 from across the street. Oh, so wow. I wanted more of a straight-on angle rather than shooting up, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, it's so great just, expression. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd point to him. I would say, just look at me. Point at the camera. You know, he would like look right in the lens, and um, just a great subject. Used autofocus. It was on a tripod. Uh, shot probably at uh, you know wide open, and focused on the gentleman's face, and uh, probably at ISO eight hundred at least, maybe sixteen hundred, which is amazing. But wow. that's uh, the quality of what we get. You know. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, cool. Okay, let's go look at the next one beautiful shot now this looks like is that a sunrise sunset i mean it's definitely early yeah it's late. marginal marginal light that, that's dawn down okay. at um down at the harbor in havana that's uh across the 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 waterway is called moro castle which is um just incredibly historic beautiful 
and um, we just kept trying to find a good uh, a good patch of boats that were separated and and situated in a nice design type of fashion. So we just shot that uh, like along that wall there quite a bit. Again, shot with the Fuji X system, probably. Um, I'm not sure which body, but probably the uh, the 18 to 55, which is a 24 to 70 equivalent, and uh, it, it it's just razor sharp front to back. I mean, it's just uh, just amazingly sharp. You know? Awesome, and I love the color. I mean, it's obviously a great time of day. It just it's just wonderful to look at. And I see that you must have used, a, a, you know, you still had a pretty good shutter speed because I see that little uh, seagull way out there in the horizon there, and it's yeah, it's frozen. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not blurry, so that's that's really cool. And I don't it see might any have noise. Been ISO. It might have been 800, something like that, just to be able to do that because the boats, boats do move in water, which I discovered in the last couple of years. You know, so you yeah. Do it <laughs> yeah, I just figured that out. Why is nothing sharp, you know? Yeah, exactly. You can't shoot four seconds of boats on the water. It ain't going to happen, right? So, yeah, so you learn. Well, that's a different so topic. Jack, yeah, that's right. Jack the ISO up and a little faster shutter speed with uh, uh, the aperture that I needed and, and that got that. So. All right, walk me through this one. This is cool. I mean... You go to Havana, the old cars, because all of their cars were from the 50s, and they're, they're still running. Yeah, yeah. Our guy there, uh, Lazarus, who's our always – he's our guy every year because he's like – he fits right in with the group. He's, per, he's tremendous. And he's a historian. He knows the history of America better than we do in some cases, which is not unusual for people that are politically aware. But, um, yeah, basically, this is one of the last shots of the trip. We're doing our last walk. Uh, before uh, uh, leaving to, to fly out. And uh, that's um, shot with, I believe, either the XE or the X-Pro. But that's, uh, no, it's got to be the XE because that's got a three-stop uh, compensation bracket. You so know, is shot this, HDR. this is an HDR, is that right? That That is an HDR, yeah. That's and, awesome. Uh, and a real clean, real clean uh, tone mapping there, buddy. Yeah, it, thank you, man. Thank you. That was... Uh, that worked out pretty good, but that was the last shot of the trip, I think, for me, and, and um, nice way to go out. Yeah, strong composition, too, getting right up on that car, but I like how you see the, the alley. and There's that guy in the on the right-hand yeah, side there kind of looking. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'm kind of liking the uh, next time we go back there next January, um, I'm doing more and more people, and I think I'm going to go with a self-assignment to have a person somewhere in every shot. Nice. So a, a, silhou a silhouette or something in every single shot that's kind of my uh you know my my tentative goal which could change you know for next for, you know for right. next year <laughs> well that's but that's good i mean that that's a that's a great other topic for another time but giving yourself assignments is you know even the pros got to do that that's that's true all right tell me about this it. one yeah uh, we went to a restaurant um which had an elevator and we um unfortunately chose to walk up this never-ending staircase just it just went on forever and it's like is this the end no not yet up to the next is this it no not yet when we came out at the top we were looking over the rooftops of uh, some great structures and churches and there's Morrow castle in the background there but uh, just a tremendous uh, you can't get this from ground level obviously so uh, the uh, the walk was worth it so that was followed by about two or three mojitos, which which helped. <laughs> now here you're clearly using a telephoto focal length because I see that nice compression of all the elements in the scene. Yeah, that's that's either the twenty four to seventy or the fifty five to two hundred. Probably the latter. Uh, my guess would be somewhere around the. It appears to be a short telephoto, maybe uh, you know, one thirty five mm -hmm. range somewhere in there. You know. Cool. I, I like that, and you got all the crosses on the church. This is a very cool shot, and I like how you framed the the, the lighthouse there and the castle in the back. And well, you know, you've you. got the Cuban flag there, so you automatically know where you're at. That's uh, one of those things. <laughs> that's, that's very that, cool. That's right. All right, here's another one. I <laughs> uh, like this is this is great. This is so. I'm, I'm assuming now we're on a tripod panning with this, or was this handheld panning? No, we're hand holding this. This is kind of one of our go-to stops. I mean, just and there's several specific areas that we know about where there's a, it, it's pretty clean and the cars come fairly close and, and and these old cars just come non-stop just non-stop you know the color is and, uh, awesome oh this is one of many i like the kids in the back seat yeah there, but uh people yeah the clients always generate phenomenal painting shots you know the um the key there's a little different uh method with the uh the mirrorless um you need to actually uh 
it's not quite the same because there's a slight lag, a slight lag, and it's minor. But you learn to adjust for that with moving subjects. With uh, the Nikon, you, you, you get your shutter speed, pan, boom, you're done. Here you've got to give it, give it a fraction of a second to lock on to its autofocus. Uh-huh. But once you, once you do that, once you, it's a very short learning curve, and, and, and we talk to people about that as we're doing the shots. I show them examples, and it's very easy. It's very easy once you tell somebody how to do it. It, 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 it just it's, it's a piece of cake. But that's the only small glitch that we found with this, but uh, very easy to overcome. No problem at all. Very cool. And here's the last one, which is a marvelous monochrome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you look like you might have gotten I, wet doing this one. Well, I got wet. Um, my camera got wet, and it wasn't, quote, a weatherproof camera. So I was um, a little bit freaked out. The one coming out, I think, soon, uh, I believe it's the X-T1, it is rumored to be weatherproof. I'm not sure what the makers mean by that. I don't know what I mean by that. That means you can drop in water and it's kind of okay. They might not go to that extent. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, this, this got drenched. Uh, but I've always wanted to get the uh, the Melicon. That's called the Melicon. The brick wall to your left goes around the entire area you're seeing. goes all the way through the the streets of uh, of uh, yeah, Havana, the main street. And they do block that street off in these kind of storms. But I wanted this shot uh, for years. And when it got real windy one morning, we just uh, but it was headed down there. We just uh, got drenched, and it was like uh, pretty cold, man, for Havana in the morning. But then it warmed up pretty quick. And uh, but I was I was I won't make a habit out of doing this. But I was kind of amazed, surprised that the camera didn't uh, didn't lock up, get salt, didn't get anywhere in the control knobs. But uh, I just dried it off, and uh, it made it, but uh, this was a uh, very exciting scene to photograph. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. great. There's a lot there's a lot of, of uh, uh, you know attention and 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 power in this scene, and then making it monochrome was probably even better just because it was you, know, you had that gloominess anyway. Um, yeah, that's what it felt like. And again, it's it's about making what it feels like to you at the time. You know, like uh, exactly. Like yeah, you know, yeah. My favorite John Shaw quote is is that you know if I want to photograph things as they are, I'll just look at them. <laughs> yeah. Nice, you know, and, and yeah, and I'm, I, I've always tended to aside with John on that. I think this is an interpretive um, endeavor. I don't call it, like all photography art; some of it is, but it's definitely a matter of interpretation. And um, it, you know, and again, to quote the, the famous John Shaw, "A successful photograph is one that you like." You know, so you don't believe your critics if you like it. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> there you go. Well, I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing these uh, images, Tony. That really sure. shows what those uh, what that Fuji camera will do. And you know, again, mo it just goes to show you the quality of the mirrorless cameras in in general. Um, just how much things have improved with the technology. I I, I really like this um, this uh, you know what you've been able to to get out of these, and and obviously they're only going to get better. So it's it's really nice. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about it. We're we're all waiting for the uh, the 10 to 24, which will pretty much finish the lens, that wide angle area that we need. Right. And again, a couple little firmware updates, man. And um, it's easy to get caught up in the arms race, you know, and have like every new body that comes out. But uh, I'm pretty much satisfied with the XC2 and the X Pro One. I'm going to probably just uh, just keep those, um, you know, like. For a while, I'm not keep buying cameras. You know, you can go book like five minutes doing this stuff. You know, but uh, exactly, you got to know when to. You got to know when to say, I'm, "I'm done for a while." You know, and 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 uh, we're good. So hey, Tony, uh, those were amazing photographs uh, of Cuba, Havana. Um, sounds like your workshop was was just bang on, tremendous, um, fun, fun workshop. I wish I could have gone. Um, Tell you us, have to go. Uh, You're yeah, a car guy. Come on. Come on. I know. It's good stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I want to thank you again for, for coming on the Sensor Plane Photography Podcast. Um, tell our viewers where to find your workshops online. Where's your website at? Oh, the website is at TonySuite.com, and there will be a bunch of little hyperlinks. Uh, the thing we're focusing on now are our, uh, our creativity seminars. Mm-hmm. And there are one-day seminars that uh, that we book ourselves, or we're getting requested now to present the program to other people, other groups. And we're very excited about that. It gives you other ways to think outside the box and various ways to shoot and to think, various techniques, stitch pans, infrared, processing tips, etc. 
and our workshops are um, we're doing okay. We could use more people. It's a highly competitive <laughs> business, so please, uh, as hey, you know, Jason, <laughs> right? As you know, you know. So um, go to Jason's website also, but feel free to visit mine and uh, and hope to see you out there. <laughs> well, thanks, Tony. Um, absolutely. I mean, you hit it on the head. Um, so many travel places, so many things to go. Anytime you can expand your creativity, which is the purpose of why I started doing this podcast, was to get these ideas flowing. Uh, Anytime you can look at something in a different light, uh, whether it's with a different processing technique, a different focal length, you know, a different lens or, or, or accessory, whatever, it gives you a way to have fun when you're out there and have pictures that don't look like everybody else's picture. That's kind of what we're talking about. <laughs> and I think that's really key. That's what I try to do on my workshops. I know that I, I know having been out there with you, that's what you try to do with yours. Um, it, it, it's it's a good time to be a photographer. I'm, I'm glad we've got all this stuff. And these cameras, they're just part of the equation. I mean, you have to have one, but it's, it's nice to see what, what you can do. So um, thanks again for coming out here. Like I said, um, I will put the hyperlinks to your website as, as well on the blog page for this podcast. Uh, sure. And uh, we hope to see you again. I hope we can hook up again sometime soon. We'll see you out there, man. <laughs> well, thank you let so me much, just say, Tony. Let me just thank you a lot for the opportunity to, to talk with you and, and to discuss our, our, our trade a little bit. Thanks a lot. I oh, well, anytime, it. Tony. You know it. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks.